<clears throat> All right, what is going on? What are we at, Thursday? Uh, case of the day today was that blurry image that kind of looked like an x-ray, kind of not. So let's get started by just talking about what that image was. So that was a scout film of a CT. So before somebody gets a CT, they're gonna wheel the patient to the CT scanner, they're gonna put them on the table, and then the CT tech is gonna basically do a scout film. And depending on what it is, say if it's a head CT, they'll kind of do like a uh, really like low grade x-ray. It's all done in the CT scanner itself. And then they'll say, you know, hey, I wanna, I wanna capture the patient from here down to the neck, and they'll kind of do a scout film and it'll show them, well, I think actually I needed a little bit more room down here or I may have needed a little bit higher room up there. So the tech can kind of mess around with it and uh, widen the windows or uh, the plane of uh, view or you know make them narrow, whatever they need to do. That's what a scout film is. So if you ever see an image that looks blurry like this, you think it's kind of an x-ray, but it's kind of not, uh, that's probably a scout film. The other thing that I want you to take notice is this goes all the way down from the pelvis all the way up to the mid thorax. You will never see on an adult patient an x-ray that goes that uh, in like the field of view is that wide. You won't see that. It, the x-ray plate itself uh, is only about the size maybe from up here down to the um, um, superior abdomen. So it's basically the size of a chest x-ray. Imagine somebody's chest, that's how big the x-ray plate is. So we don't have a plate that's actually big enough. I don't know, maybe there is somewhere out there, but commonly, no. There's no plate big enough to go from the thorax or the chest all the way down to the pelvis. That being said, if somebody had a peds patient, we commonly do uh, this kind of x-ray on somebody who is less than one years old. Um, fun little fact, it's called a baby gram. Um, so it's done on babies and it's a baby gram. And so that we will get an x-ray from basically the neck, sometimes even a little bit higher, all the way down into the pelvis, and we can capture everything on one image because the baby's so small. And remember, the plate, the x-ray plate itself is about the size of a thorax. So if you see two things that give away that this is a scout film on a CT image. One, it's grainy, it's grainy, grainy, and you kind of think it's an x-ray, but it's not, and you can't really make anything out, it's probably a scout film. Number two, if you have a field of view that's going from the chest all the way down to the pelvis, or down to the mid-abdomen, lower abdomen, whatever, remember, you don't have an x-ray plate that is big enough or long enough to capture that whole image, so it's probably a scout film on the CT. That being said, so anybody who just joined, this was a scout film CT uh, image. This is not the actual CT, obviously. This is not an x-ray. This is the scalp film that the tech obtains before they do the CT scan. The next thing that I wanted you guys to look at, which pretty much everybody nailed that, you know, there's something going on uh, that's abnormal. I think 99% uh, said there is some abnormality. Let's go look at it real quick again. What is the one thing that's standing out to everybody? Basically, there's densities, right? There's this guy, something's going on here. And then there's this guy, something's going on here. Now, you are now a radiologist, you are nothing else. When you're listening to me right now, we're all radiologists. So here we go. We're gonna talk to each other and we're gonna say, hey, you know what? Uh, first of all, first of all, first of all, I'm gonna stress again, because I do this every single time. The right side of the patient is screen left. Left side of the patient is screen right. I'm not gonna say screen left or right anymore. I'm only gonna be talking about right and left according to what the patient is. So this may be flipped actually, when uh, I should have flipped it myself. This is screen left, but this is right side of the patient. This is screen uh, right, but it's left side of the patient. So I'm only gonna be referring to left and right of the patient now. So there's weird densities going on there, right? On one side, on the patient's left, it actually looks like a renal pelvis. You can actually see the collection, the collecting system. These are the calyces, they're going down into the renal pelvis, and you can actually see the ureter and track it all the way down into the bladder. Now we're looking at the bladder, let's zoom in here. We see this bladder, it's partially filled, and then you see this filling defect. Remember, use these words with me. You see this filling defect right here, what is this? And you see this catheter going in. This is a Foley catheter. If anybody wants to know how a Foley catheter works, you literally get the catheter up the urethra 
into the bladder, nurse or physician, whoever's um, administering the uh, Foley catheter will keep shoving, keep shoving, keep shoving until they feel some sort of resistance. And they're probably feeling the tip of the Foley catheter hitting the uh, posterior wall, the bladder, the superior wall, somewhere in the bladder. Once they feel like they're uh, as far as they need to be in the bladder, they're gonna inflate the balloon it ranges, every Foley catheter is different, I don't know, 5 cc's, 10 cc's of uh, saline. They inflates the balloon and then they're going to pull back on the catheter until it's nice and taut in the bladder and it's pressing against, in this instance, I think this is a, no, this is a female and that's important and I'll tell you why in a little bit. That's a Foley catheter. Fun little fact because you know I love fun little facts. Sometimes these Foley catheters, the balloon itself can be inflated in the prostate. That sucks. Uh, a lot of patients... Uh, I've seen over the years have had their uh, Foley balloon inflated in the prostate. A lot of these patients are obtunded. They have, you know, stroke, CVA, whatever it is. They can't really speak. They're sedated. So they have no, you know, there's no uh, reflex as far as pain stimulus. So that's up to the radiologist to point out, hey, you know what? This is actually in the uh, prostate itself. You probably want to reposition this. Uh, that's, that's bad. That can lead to some chronic issues, uh, you know, dribbling, uh, incontinence, that kind of stuff. So going back to what we were talking about, you see the renal pelvis. You can actually see the shadow of the kidney right here. Another fun little fact, I'm not gonna give you the answer right now, but I want somebody to eventually tell me, and I'll probably put this up as a KUB one day, what are, except for the, the bowel itself, what are the five organs that you should be seeing the outlines of on a KUB? Uh, don't answer that now, but we'll get to that at some point. So here we go. You see the renal pelvis, you see the ureter going down, then you look at this side and what's going on over here. We're looking at the densities now, okay? Look at the density of here, look at, I can kinda see through this renal pelvis to the other side, kinda. Why does this look different? This looks a lot whiter, whiter, as in the, the shade, color, whatever you wanna call it. This looks whiter and than this and it looks chunky. It doesn't look nice and thin like this. Some people may have confused this for being hydronephrosis. The other thing that I want to point out before we go any further is why are the kid or why is that left kidney even lit up? If you're doing the CT scan right now, why is the left kidney already have contrast in the renal pelvis? That's a question to ask. I see this happen a lot, okay? So a patient is well, here's one clinical scenario, okay? A patient had some sort of trauma, a patient had something that happened, they went to a small hospital and the small hospital did a CT scan, they noticed an emergent finding and then they transferred them over to a tertiary care center, which is where I work right now. At the tertiary care center, we're actually equipped, we have all the different services to handle whatever it is, then they do a repeat CT scan to figure out what exactly the outside hospital had seen, because that outside hospital had given them contrast in that initial CT scan, now the contrast has gone through the arterial phase, gone through the venous phase, gone through the portal venous phase, and now it's in the excretory phase. So this is excretory phase happens like 10 minutes after you administer contrast. And it can hang around for a while depending on what the renal function is, how if the patient is obstructed or not. So in this clinical scenario, this is kind of like a ureterogram or a kind of like um, a pilogram. So we didn't necessarily mean to give the patient contrast through their IV and then image them a lot later. It just happened this way and it just made for a beautiful image. So that's what's going on here. Yes, you can opacify the collecting system retrograde. If we wanna go over the definition, Retrograde versus anterograde. Anterograde is the body's physiologic way of excreting urine. So you either give it through the IV or the patient's normally peeing. Uh, that's gonna go from the kidney to the ureter down into the bladder. That's anterograde, so it's gonna go that way. Retrograde is if a urologist were to get a catheter through the urethra into the bladder, out into the ureter for some reason, there's many reasons, and then opacify retrograde up, so it's retro. So anterograde versus retrograde, it makes a big difference. As an interventional radiologist, I will opacify something anterograde. How do I do that? It's not because I'm giving it through the IV. I'll get a 22 gauge needle, stick the renal collecting system probably through a calyx, uh, and then I can inject contrast through there, and then I'll get anterograde opacification and it will go down. 
as a urologist, which I am not, they will go retrograde up. So that's just the difference. This just happened to be an IV pilogram. It's actually the ureters are lit up, the uh, real pelvis is lit up. So it just happened to uh, pacify the collecting system. So now that we explained this side, that's what's going on there. We talked about the bladder, we talked about the filling defect down here, which is the Foley balloon. Then we're going on to this side right here. Why does this look a lot whiter? Why does it look chunkier? Why does it not have a ureter going down? Why, why, why? Why do we not see the kidney shadow like we do on this side? Why do we not really see it on this side? We kind of do up here, but not really. That, sorry, let me drink some water here. That's a staghorn calculus. So that's a big, big, chunky calculus sitting in the renal pelvis. You will see staghorn calculus, they may you know, start off small, they may be like little stones here and there, but eventually they're gonna get like this, just rock sitting in the renal pelvis. You can imagine that a urologist can't really go in there and do lithotripsy and break that up. It's just a solid rock sitting in there. It's gonna be really hard. Yeah, we're getting to struvite, somebody just asked. So you can imagine that this is a huge, huge like chunk sitting in the renal pelvis. They like to call it a staghorn calculus, so because it's in the renal pelvis, which is right here, let's let me stand up here. So this is the renal pelvis and kind of humor me here. You can kind of see that it goes into the calyx a little bit, maybe a little bit right here. If anybody's curious as to what a calyx is. So here's the renal pelvis and then it'll go into the calyx like that. The calyces are towards the periphery of the kidneys and they'll be kind of all along the periphery. Fun little fact, that's what we like to access when we do a nephrostomy too. We enter a calyx and then eventually get into the collecting system. It is not a uh, common practice to go straight into the renal pelvis. So you have a staghorn calculus, the big chunk, it's gonna sit in the renal pelvis and this can be, this can lead to uh, other things. So let's talk about that a second here. So staghorn calculi, they're commonly made up of struvite like somebody just asked and struvite can it happens, and it's commonly seen with recurrent infections. It's commonly seen with women. You guys can put two and two together, and women uh, get more UTIs than men do, shorter urethra, all that good stuff. So it's commonly seen in women, commonly seen uh, this type of material, struvite stone, and it has certain bacteria that are commonly seen with it. Uh, Klebsiella, Proteus, Pseudomonas, those are the big ones, the main ones that come to mind. If anybody wants to toss out some more, please let me know. But those are the main ones that come to mind. Now, you're gonna ask, uh, is there a complication to this? Is there an end stage? Is this treatable? First of all, obviously you're gonna treat the patient if they have some sort of infection. Let's talk about infections real quick, okay? So a UTI is basically, I mean, everybody knows what a UTI is, right? Frequency, urgency, that kind of stuff. Then it's gonna to go to pyelonephritis, okay? So what is pyelonephritis? That's infection of the kidney, okay? So you have infection of the kidney. What is pyelitis? That's not infection of the kidney, that's infection of the ureter itself. It kind of makes sense, right? Because you have an infection that starts down here, you get, so it's, uh, well, let's just start from here. It's gonna go to cystitis, which is the bladder down here. It's gonna go to pyelitis, which goes up, and then it's gonna go to pyelonephritis, which is up here. So you can see how this ascending infection happened, right? Commonly seen with E. coli, that happens a lot. You can understand why. So that, those are the different terms that we're using for the types of infection. Now let's go on to, you have a big honking stone sitting in the renal pelvis. What do you think is gonna happen? Do you think that urine is gonna go by nicely, go through the pelvis, go into the ureter, blah, blah, blah? No, it's a big stone. It's probably gonna cause some sort of obstruction, right? Kind of makes sense. You have a big obstructing thing in the way. Other terms that I want you guys to get comfortable with UPJ and UVJ, P as in Paul, uh, V as in Victor, okay? So UPJ is the ureteral pelvic junction. It's the junction between the ureter and the pelvis. Where is it over here? Here's the ureter, here's the pelvis. It's about right there, okay? That's a common place for a stone to get stuck. What's the another common, I don't wanna say second, but what is another very common place? UVJ, ureter, vesicle, ureteral vesicle junction right here. UVJ, UPJ, where's my finger? There it is, okay. So those are just terms that I wanna to toss out there. There's other reasons for obstruction at UPJ. We can talk about it another time. 
Okay, where was I? Yeah, obstructed. So the patient's probably gonna get obstructed. They have this big old stone. Um, then what can you do for the obstruction? Well, guess what? Call up interventional radiology as people tend to do. So what can we offer the patient? Uh, if anybody, I hope you guys, you remember yesterday when we talked about percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography and we talked about a biliary drain and how to insert the biliary drain and all that good stuff, right? And I kind of wanted to touch upon this topic that I'm talking about now yesterday because those drains are very similar as to when we place a nephrostomy tube, okay? So the nephrostomy tube is placed uh, percutaneously. So you place it through the skin and it goes into the calyx, just like we talked about, right? It goes into the calyx, which is gonna go here, okay? So the, we're gonna go percutaneous, stick the calyx, and then we're gonna get the needle in there, we're gonna pacify, we're gonna inject some contrast, and this is all done under fluoroscopy, okay? Fluoroscopy, you remember, is a fancy type of x-ray, real time. So I inject the contrast, I'm gonna opacify the system just like this, and then I'm gonna know, okay, it does look obstructed. For example, let's say this was just ballooned up. So we're gonna say, oh yeah, it does look obstructed. So then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna insert a wire in tear here through the needle, and I'm gonna get the wire down, don't worry about the steps too much, but eventually I'm gonna get a catheter, a pigtail catheter into the renal pelvis right here through the calyx, okay? So what are the complications of a nephrostomy? The main one, you wanna be very careful. As everybody knows, the uh, kidneys are very, very vascular structures. So you wanna be very careful that you don't hit any vital vessels. Arteries are obviously the worst. You don't wanna hit an artery that can cause a lot of bleeding. Veins. It happens, I've gotten the wire into a, a renal vein plenty of times. It happens, you just pull the wire back out and you try to get access back in. You may ask, do you stick this renal pelvis, I'm uh, sorry, renal calyx, remember, you don't wanna stick the pelvis directly. You may ask, how do you stick it under a fluoroscopy? No, I use an ultrasound. So we'll use the ultrasound, we'll stick the uh, calyx, and then we'll switch over to fluoroscopy, opacify the system, figure out if it's obstructed, put the tube in. So that's how we decompress the system. The other thing, um, let's talk about if you, okay, so if you have some sort of stricture, I'll touch upon this briefly, we can talk about this a lot later, but if you have a stricture or something like that right here, okay, you want to pass the stricture and you, what we can do is offer the patient not just a nephrostomy that goes outside the system, but we can have one pigtail catheter here, then the other catheter will go down here, and then the other pigtail catheter will sit inside the bladder. This is kind of like we, we talked about yesterday with the biliary system. Remember I talked to you guys about an internal external drain. This is kind of the same thing. It's an external portion that goes out here, and then the internal portion will drain into the bladder itself. That is a nephrourethral stent, N-U-S, nephrourethral stent. So we can offer them a nephrostomy or a nephrourethral stent. Remember when I was talking about capping trials and all that good stuff? If you don't, go back to the video from yesterday. It's on YouTube. That's a little shout out. Go check it out, right? Um, but then there's a whole thing about capping trials, and that's the exact same thing we'll do here. We talked about that. Infection's the other thing. Um, so we talked about obstruction. Infection's the other big guy. So we obviously talked about that these happen because of recurrent infections. We talked about the types of bugs. Uh, uh, what did we talk about? Proteus, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. We talked about that they're made up of struvite. The other thing that I want you guys to remember is a specific type of pyelonephritis. Say yes, the patient had an acute pyelonephritis, you treated it, they went home, good to go. What is the chronic pyelonephritis commonly seen with these big struvite or staghorn calculi. Anybody want to type away, give you five seconds while I drink water and answer that, go for it. Ooh, good guess, almost there. Uh, you mentioned emphysematous pyelonephritis. I like that, um, that's not the answer that I was looking for, but it's kind of along the same lines. And the reason I say it's kind of along the same lines is because emphysematous pyelonephritis uh, is seen with diabetic patients commonly, I believe it's with women more, but diabetic patients in E. coli is commonly seen with emphysematous pyelonephritis. Those are pyelonephritis. Those are the two associations. And the entity that I'm talking about are actually those same two associations. Anybody want to guess again? Okay, uh, it's called XGP. Xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. Big words, just abbreviate it, XGP. 
Pete, it's seen with these big stones, these these like uh, staghorn calculi that go into the calyces, into the pelvis. It's just this big thing. It is a chronic, chronic infection, indolent infection that the patient can be sitting around at home with for a long time. It's once it gets to that stage, it's basically a dead kidney. Just treat it as that. I don't think, and it's a it's a granulomatous infection, by the way. It's it's no longer like the the stuff that the acute pyelonephritis was. Excuse me. So it's a granulomatous type infection, okay? So at that point, once it gets to that point, it's probably a surgical candidate and the urologist basically needs to take the kidney out. It's pretty much done. You can get uh, renal and nuclear medicine scans, uh, figure out if there's actually any function left in the kidney. Probably not once it gets to a XGP um, and you take it out. So just to reiterate, uh, did I forget anything? Let's go over real quick. I uh, said it all kind of fast as I tend to do. That's why I drink a lot of water. And I take big deep breaths because I'm doing it all in one breath. So just to reiterate, we talked about this guy right here is a scalp film of a CT. What are the two ways that you can tell this is a scalp film of the CT? One, it looks like a broke man's uh, KUB. You can't really make out any of the definition of the bone. You can't really make out any of the definition of any of the organs. You can't really tell what the bowel gas pattern is. Number two, you will never have an adult KUB that covers this length. You will never have that. This is a scalp film of the CT. This is what a tech does while the patient's in the scanner before they're about to scan in a CT. That's the first thing we covered. Number two, what we covered is why this actually has contrast in the renal pelvis and why is the ureter lit up? Because this is a delayed scan, this patient probably had an IV intravenous contrast before this on some scan prior to this, or they did this on purpose because they injected contrast into the patient's IV. They wanted the contrast to go into the collecting system because this is a intravenous pilogram. So they wanted to do this. That's, those are the two reasons this probably happened. They wanted to opacify this system. They wanted to see if there's any excretion through this kidney over here, which is the right side, okay? That's the second thing we covered. The third thing we covered was uh, the big thing. Third thing we covered was this guy right here, this big, huge staghorn calculus. It's going into the uh, calyces. This is the renal pelvis. We don't see the shadow of the kidney here. We don't see any of the pelvis lit up. We don't see the ureter going down. That was the third thing we covered. Number four, we covered the big old staghorn made up of struvite. The bacteria involved, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Proteus, 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 US Emily step one, remember that. Uh, the other thing that we covered, what was the last thing? Oh. Uh, obstruction, if the patient's obstructed, we covered uh, what a neph tube, how they, uh, we briefly covered how I place a neph tube. A nephroureteral stent is the other thing that we covered. Uh, we covered anterograde versus retrograde, who does what? Remember, anterograde, interventional radiology, retrograde urology, they go in from below to up. We covered the different types of ascending infection. Yes, somebody mentioned plane of Braudel. Yes, I love that. So that's uh, what they're talking about right now is Braudel's avascular plane. If this is the kidney right here and this is the back of the kidney, this is the front where the artery and vein are. So I want to go back this way. I don't want to go into the center of it either, right in the middle, because that's where all the vasculature is. I would love to go kind of inferior or superior and hit a calyx and stay away from all this vasculature over here. That's Braudel's avascular pl plane, which is right here. Good. I'm glad you mentioned that. So that's the... Fifth thing we covered, I don't know where we're at. So we talked about obstruction, we talked about how to cure the obstruction, we talked about uh, infection, well we talked about ascending infection. Starting from below, it's gonna be cystitis, bladder gets infected, it's gonna be pyelitis, which is basically the ureter is gonna be infected, and then it's gonna be pyelonephritis, which is the kidney is gonna be infected. Um, fun fact for internists who are ordering uh, renal ultrasounds for pyelonephritis, you're not actually ordering the ultrasound to check for pyelonephritis. It is very hard for me to tell if there's pyelonephritis on ultrasound. That's not why you should be ordering the ultrasound. If you're ordering it, here's the reason why. You're looking for associations with pyelonephritis or complications of it. Basically, you wanna see if there is a renal abscess. That's what you wanna check for. Pyelonephritis, remember, is clinical diagnosis. Patient has a UTI, but then they're febrile and they start having rigors and they're shaking, all that good stuff. Hey, it's probably py pyelonephritis, right? Uh, UTIs, frequency, urgency, that kind of stuff. I'm talking fast right now, I'm getting dehydrated again. 
What was the other thing we covered? We talked about instruction. We talked, oh, chronic indolent infection. So you treated the pyelonephritis. You gave him uh, cephalos. Somebody tell me what you give him. Uh, Zithromycin? I don't know. I'm a radiologist, right? Uh, I use very few antibiotics in IR. So you treat them with whatever in the acute infection. They get better. They go home, but they still have this big stone. They come back incidentally a lot later. Now they have this huge stone sitting in the pelvis. It's going into the calyces and the kidney looks super infected, but it's a chronic indolent infection. That's xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, XGP. Remember that chronic indolent infection that probably needs to get surgerized and get taken out. No antibiotics are going to touch that thing. Whew. Anything else that we're, uh, we need to talk about on this scan, 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 scan? I don't think so. Any questions? That was a lot to take in, as I tend to do. I'm gonna talk fast, I'm gonna get it all out, uh, and then questions. Good, good, good. There's uh, another component to, I don't wanna get into it yet because I'm gonna use this for a case of the day at one point. So I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> what else, what else, what else? Come on, guys. Uh, Pinky Bell's Us. Thank you. Looking forward to more teaching. Hey, appreciate it. I'm doing this for you guys. I uh, love doing it. I'm putting together a huge, huge, huge case file right now. I posted on my stories earlier. I, I think when I posted, I was at like uh, slide five, 20, something like that. And now I'm at six something. I don't even think I put like I'm a fourth done, but I think I'm like an eighth done right now. So it's, uh, it's good. It's good, it's good, it's good. I'll, I'll post these cases uh, for, God, a long time now. All right, we good? Um, I realized uh, when I started posting these to YouTube that I talk a lot. It's like over a half an hour, 35, 37 minutes the last couple times. Uh, hopefully I'm not rambling. Hopefully it's good stuff. Um, seriously, go subscribe to that YouTube channel. I think I know what I'm doing at this point. Uh, not really. But I appreciate you guys. Uh, we'll pick it up next time. As always, I appreciate y'all. Later.